fourth annual lecture series held by the College of the Bahamas uh, in collaboration with the Nassau Institute. We're pleased to again have Dr. Evelyn, who you've been introduced to already, informally, of course we'll do it more formally after we uh, complete some um, preliminary uh, presentations. But for now, what I'd like to do is introduce you to our dean, um, Ms. Ramada Moxley. She, I can say she's a steward for the School of Business. She's a hard worker. She's an influential leader. For me, she is, uh, believe it or not, she may not believe this, but she has turned my life around in some respect. And she probably knows it, but she won't say it. But again, I'm, I'm happy to have her. She's not only a steward for the School of Business, but she's also influential to faculty members who she um, encourage every day, not only to live up to the mandate of the college, but to develop person, pursue personal development for themselves. And she's always, she's also an influential person for students. Students always turn to her in time of need. Anytime they're under any problem, they go directly to her, and she always has a solution. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Dan Moxie. Thank you very much, Mr. Forbes. I do hope I can live up to that. But thank you for your kind words, nevertheless. I make a concerted effort to resolve issues. I am one of those who believe that that's what they pay me to do. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Rick Lowe, Vice President mm -hmm. and Treasurer of the Nassau Institute. Dr. Richard Ebling, Professor of Ethics and Free Enterprise Leadership of the CEDESOL in Charleston, South Carolina. Any other directors of the Nassau Institute? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. Sorry. Do we have anyone here from the foundation? Mr. Randall, Mr. Randy Forbes, Assistant Professor and Head of Department of the Banking, Economics, and Finance Department at the College of Bahamas, faculty, students, staff, guests, good morning. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you here this morning to the continuation of the NASA Institute's 2015 lecture series, which was launched last week, Thursday evening in this beautiful edifice an edifice of which we are all indeed extremely proud. The NASA Institute was founded some 20 years ago to get the citizenry of this country to engage in research, deep thinking, reflective thinking, from which would emerge a think tank, to engage in active discourse to promote capitalism and free markets in the Bahamas. The mission of the Institute, and I quote, is to develop and promote public policies for the Bahamas undergirded by principles of limited government, freedom for all, in accordance with the law, end of quote. We in the Bahamas may take freedom for granted. Unfortunately, freedom of movement, freedom of discourse, freedom of dialogue, and for some, freedom to gather collectively to engage in active discourse on issues by which they may be affected is not available to all. Therefore, I invite all of you to be active participants. Be the voice of those for those who have no voice, but are unable to utilize it for the betterment of humanity because of what we may take for granted, the absence of freedom to participate in such engagements. Over the years, the Institute has brought a cadre of scholars to our land to inform, to educate, to invoke thought, deep thinking, and active discourse on a multiplicity of economic, social, and topical issues. Last week, this year's lecture series commenced with the lecture delivered by Dr. Thomas D. Lorenzo, who spoke on the topic, How America Became a Corporate Welfare State, Lessons for the Bahamas. The storehouse of knowledge of those who were present was undoubtedly increased. The lecture was informative, it was stimulating, thought-provoking, 
and provided us with the genesis of how governments were funded. And as I spoke with Mr. Forbes yesterday, he said to me it was about comparative economic thought. For the next few days, you will hear from Dr. Richard Ebeling, who is a professor of ethics and free enterprise leadership at the Citizel in South Carolina. He's no stranger to the Bahamas. We thank him for his presence and his participation in these series over the years. Undoubtedly, those in attendance will be the beneficiary of information on society, economics, and social issues. I note that even value-added tax will emerge to the fore on Friday during the lecture on the physical crisis of our time, the ethics and economics of income taxes. If you have not done so already, we invite you to visit the website at www.nasainstitute.org to register for the sessions on Friday and Saturday. We also ask you to bring a friend, to bring a family member. The sessions are free and lunch is provided. To the Nassau Institute, the Templeton Foundation, the Banking and Economics and Finance Department of the College of the Bahamas, and to our students, we thank you for exposing our students and our community to an international perspective on economic thoughts. It is these thoughts that undergird every society, and we are truly grateful. On behalf of the administration, the faculty, the staff, and our students of the College of the Bahamas, we wish to express our sincere gratitude to the executives of the Nassau Institute, especially Mr. Rick Lowe, because it was many years ago that Mr. Lowe had the vision to engage our students, to engage our faculty. And as a result, there are many who have left the halls of the College of the Bahamas whose perspective on economic thought has been improved as a result of Mr. Lowe's intervention. And for that, we say thank you, Mr. Lowe. We are indeed grateful. We also wish to say thank you to the executive directors and members of the Institute for engaging our students, our faculty over the past years, giving them opportunities and exposure which they may not have obtained otherwise. We at the college are truly grateful and we are honored to be a part of these forum. Once again, many thanks, welcome, best wishes for a successful 2015 lecture series, and good morning to all of you. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be with you again. Um, this is, as we said, the fourth time that I'm here, and I want to especially thank the College of the Bahamas and the Dean and uh, Dr. Forbes for their support and encouragement for having this uh, opportunity. Um, we live in a big world that has become increasingly one globalized community, and that means that we need to share ideas and to become informed about the different perspectives in which we can think about the issues and the policies that concern all of us as, to use a phrase, citizens of the world. Um, of course, on one level, we think of ourselves as Americans, Bahamians, Canadians, Costa Ricans, uh, French, and so on. But the fact is, is that uh, we have certain things that are in common. We're human beings. We have common goals, interests, purposes. And we're devising and attempting to find ways to make our lives better, both freedom as well as material comfort and prosperity. And I like to think that economics uh, is a field that offers that universal understanding and avenue, venue, for having an insight into these types of issues. And that has been the, the logic and the purpose and the ideal of these lectures now for the fourth time. And I really appreciate you having me down here. You have, first of all, a beautiful country. Uh, and uh, I, as was mentioned, I'm in South Carolina now, which has a more mild climate. But uh, I was previously living in Michigan. And uh, uh, there they have like Fahrenheit of uh, like you know, five degrees. <laughs> and so I would be coming down here and my wife would say, I talk to my wife and I'm walking the dog at minus five degrees. And she never seemed too happy about it. She said, but I'm not here for the fun in the Bahamas. I'm lecturing. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you have a beautiful country and 
a gracious population that's always made me feel very at home and, uh, and welcome. And I want to thank you again for that. And without further ado, let me start getting into the material that I do want to discuss. The theme of this first lecture is associated the moral foundations of a free society, liberty, responsibility, and justice of private property in the free market. I want to put this in a wider context of that. Okay, I want to start off with a quote from a fairly well-known economist in the U.S. called Steve Landsberg. Uh, this was from a, an editorial he had in the Wall Street Journal a few years ago. Modern humans first emerged about 100,000 years ago. For the next 99,800 years or so, nothing happened. Well, not quite nothing. There were wars, political intrigue, the invention of agriculture, but none of that stuff had much effect on the quality of people's lives. Almost everyone lived on the modern equivalent of $400 to $600 a year, just above what we today would consider below the subsistence level. True, there were always tiny aristocracies who lived far better, but numerically they were quite insignificant. Then, just a couple of hundred years ago, maybe 10 generations, people started getting richer, and richer and richer still per capita income, at least in the West, began to rise at the unprecedented rate of about three quarters of a percent each year. A couple of decades later, the same was happening around the world. Then it got even better. By the 20th century, per capita real incomes, that is, incomes adjusted for inflation, were growing at 1.5% a year on average. And for the past half century, they have been growing at about 2.3%. If you're earning a modest middle class income of $50,000 a year, of course, they're thinking of the US here, and if you expect your children 25 years from now to occupy the same modest rung on the economic ladder that you have had, then with a 2.3% growth rate, they will be earning the inflation-adjusted equivalent of $89,000 a year. So that's in one generation. Your children versus yourself. Their children, another 25 years down the line, will earn $158,000 a year, assuming that on average annual growth rate in real income and, and, uh, and uh, gross domestic product. Now this is an interesting diagram. This shows uh, the standard of living in the world until uh, the First World War. Um, last year was 2014, the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the First World War in Europe, 1914. And this gives you an idea of the standard of living of all of humanity for virtually all of, of the last 2,000 years. Uh, we can see here that whether we're talking about Western Europe, Eastern Europe, but today, of course, the U.S. It didn't exist thousand years ago, Japan, China, India, Africa, all of them were operating at a level of extreme uh, low subsistence or barely above poverty, with many people often dying of plagues, pestilences, wars, droughts, floods. But then something began to happen in the late 1700s. And then through the 1800s, the 19th century, standards of living began to rise. And if you notice, it happened first, that blue line, Western Europe, Great Britain first, Holland, then France, then parts of Western Germany, and then spreading to other parts of Europe, the Scandinavian countries. And that continued with, the, with Western Europe increasing at a much higher rate up until 1800 and, and then into the, into, 1800s into the 20th century. And then, of course, the United States, far exceeding even the Western Europeans. And then now, at the in, up until here, you started seeing a slow increase in the other uh, parts of the world. Now, why did this happen? Why was it that for most of human history of the last 2,000 years, everybody lived a life, to use a phrase from the famous British political philosopher Thomas Hobbes, a life that was nasty, brutish, and short. And yet somehow something happened first in Europe, and then has slowly but surely spread over the world, that has enabled people slowly but surely to escape from abject poverty, and in many cases to live standards of living that would be the envy of humanity a mere few hundred years ago. Since 1900, the global gross domestic product that is a measurement of the real value of all goods and services produced uh, on an annual basis, the global gross domestic product has increased far more than the population increase. Look at these numbers here. In 1820, the world population was slightly more than one billion people. 
By 1900, the world population was 1.5 billion. So in that 80 year period, as best as dem demographers can estimate, in 80 years, the, the world population increased by 50%. By 2013, the world's population had reached about 7 billion. Okay? So in slightly more than a century, the population increased almost sevenfold, the global population of the world. And during the 20th century, world gross domestic product increased from not more than $1 billion to almost $85 trillion, as estimated from calculating different countries around the world in 2010. This has been a huge, dramatic increase in the amount of real goods and services produced. And at an accelerated rate, that has exceeded dramatically what has become a significant increase in population. Because the pie could be growing, but if the number of people who are eating out of the pie is growing faster than the pie is growing, then even though the pie is bigger, everybody is getting a smaller slice. But our case has been the reverse of that. The pie has been growing faster than the mouths eating from the pie. So that while the pie has been growing, and even though there are more mouths to be fed, each person, on average per capita, has a larger piece of that pie to consume. That is a dramatic effect of growth around the world. Now, again, it has not been happen happening to the same degree, at the same rate, to all places in the world and all people in those different places in the world. But while before, this type of improvement in standard of living were considered to be specially, uniquely Western Europe the America, North America, it is now global. In the last 25 or 30 years, hundreds of millions, not thousands, hundreds of millions of people in China have been lift, lifted out of abject poverty with the reforms that they have introduced there. And the same thing has been happening in India, where the images were 50 years ago that these were countries in which 98% of the people live at starvation circumstances. And that has dramatically changed in one person's lifetime. This escape from global and human poverty has been a, the result of a radical change, I would argue, in other scholars, in the social and economic conditions that, uh, and trends that first occurred in the West, especially over the last 300 years. It has been associated with the emergence, as I say here, of the development of the modern free market economy and competitive capitalism. The achievement of capitalist society has given an increasing percentage of mankind rising standards of living and a quality of life along with growing material security and comfort that we increasingly take for granted. Now, on the one hand, there have been many critics of capitalism. Capitalism is probably thought of as crude material uh, wealth, uh, a greedy profit motive, uh, a narrow selfishness of self-interest, uh, anti-social conduct, disregard for others and their welfare, and somehow an unjust inequality of income and wealth. And therefore, there's been this paradox. On the one hand, uh, competitive capitalism, unleashing innovation, the opportunity to improve oneself, guided by the profit motive, which we'll be talking about. Yet at the same time, critics have said, oh, the wealth has accompanied, been accompanied by all of these negative aspects. But let me suggest that there are others who have suggested that this is not the way we, per se, should look upon this. One economist, Deirdre McCluskey, uh, has been writing a series of books on uh, bourgeois society, that is middle class society. Bourgeois is just a French word that emerged in the 1800s, uh, 1700s and 1800s, meaning the middle class. And so he's written a number, uh, she's written a number of books uh, on uh, bourgeois, uh, bourgeois virtues, uh, bourgeois integrity, uh, she's coming out with another one. I forget the exact variation of that is. It's a series she's writing. But she's argued that we should be emphasizing what, what is accompanied, in fact, has been the motor force of competitive free market capitalism and generating these wealth, this wealth and these opportunities are virtues. And these are some of the virtues that she has emphasized has come with opening the economic arena to competitive market forces. Pride of action, the proper sense of accomplishment, Integrity, reliability, honor, truthfulness, uprightness. Honest, fear free of deceit, morally correct, virtuous. Worthy of confidence, dependable. Enterprise, initiative, 
undertake difficulty, demanding tasks. Humor, take things in stride. Respect, giving others due regard, deference to others. Modesty, not prideful or overconfident about oneself. Consideration, careful thought about actions and effects on others. Responsibility, fulfilling tasks and promises to oneself and others. Prudence, governing one's actions with reasoned judgment. Thrift, careful management of one's time, actions, and resources. Self-possession, control of actions or emotions, especially under stress and conjective, careful and deliberative weighing of circumstances. What McCluskey has argued is that the, the market economy has tended to cultivate, foster, create positive motives and incentives to develop all of these human characteristics to a greater extent. Now, since the beginning of time, there have been crooks, con men, hucksters, and manipulators. Okay? That's part of the human condition, unfortunately. Uh, and deception has always been going on. Uh, if you read the ancient Greeks, right, from the time of like Plato and Aristotle, you read the tragedies and the comedies, and you find that, 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 that the, 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 the nature of man, his passion and compassion, his, his heroism, his cowardice, uh, his resolution, his, his uncertainties, all of these aspects of the, of the, of the, human, the human makeup uh, is the same. But McCluskey's point has been, is that what aspects of human nature, what qualities in human conduct and human psychology are fostered, cultivated, given positive reinforcement, is influenced by the institutional setting in which people can go about their activities of daily life. And he has, she has argued that this is the case more, okay, with competitive capitalism. Now, we're going to be talking later today uh, about the failure of socialism. Um, I, I, I traveled in the old Soviet Union when, it was, when the system was communism there. Uh, I was doing consulting work on market reform and privatization in the last years of, uh, of the Soviet regime. And uh, one of the things that, um, that stuck, out, stuck out for me is how different people were, even though we're all the same. On the one hand, I found that Russians, one-to-one, -one, were very much like uh, I found my fellow countrymen, Americans. Americans tend to immediately be on a first-name basis. They're very informal, uh, very friendly, very open, uh, as opposed to the Brits sometimes, and certainly the French. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll be nice, play nice in the global sandbox. Can you really trust the people who have a language in which they don't pronounce half the letters in their words? What are they hiding? What are those French hiding? I don't understand those. But anyway, separate from that. Um, but once it became in a setting of interpersonal uh, interactions in the wider social context, Russians, I always found, were very different than what I view as many of the qualities and characteristics of, in general, people in the West, and certainly my fellow Americans. Because of the system in which they operated under, in, under socialism and communism, there were rewards and incentives to be deceitful, manipulative, cheating, lying, to use a phrase, kissing up to people, because your opportunity for, for improvement depended upon only one avenue, and that was that the bureaucrat above you had a positive view of you because of the things you did for him and with him. Because you see, the government owned everything. The government owned all the resources. The government owned all the factories. The government owned all the retail stores. There was no employer other than the government, right? The government was the monopoly. So if you didn't get along with the guy above you, and if the guy above you didn't like you, and give you certain promotional benefits and perks, your life could be a disaster including the extreme case of, of uh, uh, you know, fear, uh, uh, accusations of political dissent, you could end up imprisoned, tortured, killed, or sent to a labor camp in Siberia. It develops different quality and attributes to work through that, sort of that maze of how do you get by in life. And McCluskey's point is that the institutional setting fosters things, 
It doesn't mean that human nature is malleable and has changed, but there are many sides of us. In the market economy, we have these phrases which all of us have heard about. The customer is always right, service with a smile. In the Soviet Union, I would go into a government-run retail store for food, for drinks, for anything, glum, passive, unfriendly. Why? Because they don't have to be concerned with getting your business. Why don't they have to be concerned with getting your business? There's no other place to go! I don't know about here, but there is one play institution in the U.S. that every American hates periodically to visit, the Department of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> getting your li driver's license or your license plate for your car. Ah, oh, it's a terrible experience. Okay, think of the entire world as like the Department of Motor Vehicles. Okay, assuming your experience is sometimes as frustrating as in the United States with that. The benefits of commercial and market society have been emphasized and understood by a number of prominent thinkers for a very long time. I just have two quotes here from the famous uh, French uh, philosopher Voltaire and uh, his another Frenchman, uh, Count of Baron de Montesquieu. And just to quickly, uh, Voltaire from his essay on commerce. The merchant himself often hears his profession spoken of disdainfully, that he is a fool enough to blush. Yet I don't know what is the more useful to a state, a well-powdered lord who knows precisely what time the king gets up in the morning and what time he goes to bed, and who gives himself airs of grandeur while playing the role of slave in a minister's antechamber, or a great merchant who enriches his country, sends orders from his office to, to Surat and to Cairo, and contributes to the well-being of the world. Who's more useful? Some guy who's, oh, your majesty, or who's busy figuring out how to profitably acquire the things that are available around the world to bring them through transportation to his own country to make them available to the ordinary citizens of the society. Who's, who's to be more praiseworthy? The guy who bows before the king? or is interesting to satisfying your wants and desires in the marketplace. Or as Montesquieu said, commerce is a cure for the most destructive prejudices. For it is almost a general rule that whenever we find agreeable manners, there commerce flourishes. And that whenever there is commerce, there we meet agreeable manners. The spirit of trade produces in the mind of a man a certain sense of exact justice, opposite, on the other hand, to robbery. The spirit of commerce is naturally attended with that of frugality, economy, moderation, labor, prudence, tranquility, order, and rule. So long as the spirit subsists, the riches it produces has not bad effect. From his famous, The Spirit of the Law is one of the great political philosophic works of the 1700s. And then one other example of this is from the famous Scottish economist Adam Smith, author of The Wealth of Nations. And uh, he, he points out the benefits of trade and commerce. Okay? It's not only that the goods are delivered, but it cultivates a certain attitude in people. And as he says in, in, in one of his essays, is that people may act on their self-interest, but their self-interest therefore gets reinforced as the habits and manners of the society. The merchant who comes into con co connection with his customers every day may be polite and courteous, honest and dependable, out of his own self-interest. He doesn't want to lose the business. He's concerned uh, about uh, the customers turning to another supplier. And in that, he therefore has to show his dependability, his reliability, his punctuality, his honesty. But over time, Smith argued, over time, these, these attitudes towards others in the marketplace, in your own self-interest, become habituated, routinized, parts of the customer nutrition of polite and courteous and nice behavior. So that what began by the merchant's self-interest in trying to please the customer so as not to lose the, the sales that he could get becomes part of the daily experiences of life. Or to actually have this quick quote from Smith from his lectures on jurisprudence. Whenever commerce is introduced into under any country, probity, honesty, and punctuality always accompany it. It is far more reducible to self-interest, that general principle which regulates the actions of every man, and which leads, which leads men to act in a certain manner from views of advantage, and is as deeply implanted in an Englishman as a Dutchman. A dealer is afraid of losing his character, his reputation, and is scrupulous in observing every engagement. When a person makes perhaps 20 contracts in a day, he cannot gain so much by endeavoring to impose on his neighbors, cheating on them, as the very appearance of a cheat 
would make him lose. When people seldom deal with one another, we find that they are somewhat disposed to cheat because they can gain more by a smart trick than they can lose by the injury that it does to their character. Whenever dealings are frequent, a man does not expect to gain so much by any one contract as by probity and punctuality in the whole. And a prudent dealer who is sensible of his real interest would rather choose to lose what he has a right to than to give any ground for suspicion. When the greater part of the people are merchants, they always bring probity and punctuality into fashion. And these, therefore, are the principal virtues of a commercial nation. Okay. So it is the fact that you can't compel someone to trade with you, that you can't force them to enter into a contract, that they have options and alternatives to not buying from you, that makes each seller in his own self-interest to demonstrate these qualities and characteristics, honesty, punctuality, reliability, and that these then become the manners and customs of good and good conduct and behavior for the society as a whole. Now, the quest for freedom has been going on for a long time, but without much achievement through most of human history. From ancient times, there were many thinkers and philosophers who dreamed of a world without slavery or cruel kings. But for most of human history, this was only a dream. The ancient Greeks spoke of the importance of power of human reason and the value of men having freedom to, of thought and speech to understand the objective world in which they lived. The ancient Romans sometimes argued for a universal conception of law that would apply to all men equally and to which all reasoning men of good will would agree upon and follow as being consistent with man's nature. And the ancient Hebrews and Christians appealed to a higher law of right and justice given to men by the Creator and to which all men and of course, the ancient Hebrews and Christians emphasized a higher law, to which all men and people were accountable, given by God. But in reality, throughout the thousands of years of human history, men lived under conquerors and kings who claimed to rule by divine right. And the mass of humanity were used and abused for the ends of those who had earthly power and control over societies. And that began to change in the late 1600s and early 1700s, particularly through the writings of a variety of English uh, philosophers, political philosophers, though of course not exclusively English or just philosophers. The most prominent one was, of course, uh, John Locke. John Locke uh, uh, lived in, as you can see, 1632 to 1704. He's most famous for two treatises on government. The first, the first volume is uh, a criticism of the idea of divine right of kings. Who's this guy who claims to rule over us? How do we know God chose him? He's being a little arrogant here. Volume two, the second treatise on government, is a positive statement about well, how should society be uh, interact, uh, be run, and what is the role of government? In? And here he said is that men are born with certain natural rights given by God and that our reason can demonstrate is right and just if we reflect upon it. Which one of us would like to be killed by our fellow men? Which one of us would like to be robbed of that which we have honestly produced? Which one of us would want to be deceived and, and defrauded in our dealings with our fellow men? None of us. All of us wish our life and our, and our liberty and our honestly acquired property to be respected by others in society. Our own reason reinforces and explains the logic behind what Locke believed was man's right to his own life given by God. God creates life, only God should take away life. Who, ha who has the arrogance to play God to say when a person should die by taking that person's life <coughs> with his own hands? And that extended to property. Though the earth and all inferior creatures be common to all men, yet every man has a property in his own person. This nobody has a right to but himself. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. Whatever then he removes out of the state of nature, hath provided and left it in, he hath mixed his labor with it and joined it, something that is his own, and thereby makes it his property. It being by him removed from the common state of nature, it hath by this labor something annexed to it that excludes the common right of other men. For this labor being the unquestionable property of the laborer, no man but he can have a right to what that is once joined to. Okay? You settle in some area never claimed by others, right? Virgin, unclaimed, settled land. 
you clear the field, you, 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 lay, you lay the crops, you harvest them, you build your house, and that idea of like the frontiersman, would you not consider it right and just that that which your mental labor in imagining the plan, right, the blueprint, and when your physical labor is brought into reality, that it's not yours, rightly and justly? Would any of us not be offended if another attempted to take it away from us or steal or plunder that which our labors had produced? And Locke, therefore, is saying is that our most fundamental premise on self-reflection is that each person wants to be free and to have liberty to apply his mind and his labors and to keep the fruits of his own effort. <clears throat> this became the basis of the American Declaration of Independence when we kicked the Brits out. We kicked them out, too. You just took a little longer. Okay? We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem more likely to affect their safety and happiness. That's the right of revolution. You have a, a, an abusive king, you have a tyrant ruling over you, a dictator who, who commands you and brutalizes you. Men have a right to overthrow that government and institute a government that will secure their rights to life, liberty, property, happiness, rather than to abridge it or violate it. Inseparable from this is this right to property. Famous British economist, John, John R. McCulloch, uh, in what was in the middle of the 19th century was a popular economics textbook that he wrote, emphasized, let us therefore not deceive ourselves by supposing that it is possible for any people to emerge from barbarism but to become wealthy, prosperous, and civilized without the securing of property. The protection afforded to property by all civilized societies, though it has not made all men rich, has done more to increase their wealth than all their other institutions put together. The establishment of a right to property enables exertion, invention, and enterprise, forethought, and economy to reap their due reward. But it does this without inflicting the smallest imaginable injury upon anything else. Its, that is, property's effects are altogether beneficial. It is a rampart again, raised by society against its common enemies, against rapine and violence, plunder, and oppression. Without its protection, the rich would become poor, and the poor would be totally unable to become rich. All would be all would sink to the bottom, the same bottomless abyss of barbarism and poverty. Let me take my example of that you've settled in an area, you've cleared the field, you've laid the crop, you built your home, you, you watched over the crop, you've now harvested it, and bandits, a gang of bandits of thieves, come down from the surrounding hills and they proceed to plunder you, to steal your crop, threaten your life. Would not any one of us be shocked and feel that something unjust and immoral was being undertaken by these bandits and thieves? This is mine. And now if you, they took you that, that which your efforts had produced, and you now feared that they would do so again at the end of the next harvest season, what would happen to your motives, your incentives, your willingness to be as industrious, hardworking, and fore, forethoughtful again <clears throat> in wanting to plant another crop? to care for it, to give your industry and effort and resources to bring it to cultivated harvest. When again you fear that once it's harvested, the bandits and thieves will come again to plunder you and once more threaten your life. What will happen to your interest and willingness to do this? Only when you, the fruits of your labor are secure, your property rights are secure, do people have a confidence, even implicitly, it's not like you constantly think about it, but just intuitively. If I work hard and I'm industrious and and I do the right things to, 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 to produce things that have value and productively, and of course, always a little bit of luck, I can reap the reward. And my right to that reward will be respected by others against violence and theft. Only through that way has man raised himself out of poverty. This has been emphasized by another more recent thinker, Richard Pipes, he's now retired. He was long a professor of history uh, at uh, Harvard University. He was on the uh, Foreign Advisory 
uh, panels uh, for Ronald Reagan uh, in the U.S. government when Reagan was president in the 1980s. He's considered one of the world's experts on the history of Imperial Russia and the Soviet Union. Uh, and he wrote a book a few years ago on the relationship between property and freedom. The political argument in favor of property holds that it promotes stability and constrains the power of government. From the moral point of view, it is said that property is legitimate because everyone is entitled to the fruits of his labor. The economic line of reasoning for property holds to that it's the most efficient means of producing wealth, incentives. The psychological defense of property maintains that it enhances the individual's sense of identity and self-esteem. Look, I produced it through my efforts. I'm proud of it. The right to property in of itself does not guarantee civil rights and liberty, but historically speaking, it has been the single most effective device for ensuring both because it creates an autonomous sphere in which by mutual consent, neither the state nor the society can encroach. In other words, this is your little domain. This is your little kingdom, your sovereign personal state, if you will. It's called your home and your person. And where property rights are respected, both government and your fellow citizen cannot violate you. You can make your own little world. Think of how often you've gone to somebody's home and you've complimented them. Oh, you've decorated it so nicely. What fine taste in furniture. But you're really thinking, boy, I'd never furnish my house like this. This person has really lousy taste, but you know, you call it, you never say that, right? You know what I'm talking about here, okay? But you know what? You can go to your home and you can decorate it and furnish it and have pictures and paintings that you want. You can fill it with the music that you enjoy. Even if you, some, someone else thought that, who would want to listen to that music? Boy, what a bad taste in, you know, in, in, the, in, in, in the wallpaper. But it's your own. You see, you can make your own little world to fit your taste, your enjoyments, your values, what gives meaning and pleasure to you. And that's what property enables, even in the most humble home, a degree of that, because it's yours. That's not unimportant. By drawing the line between the public and the private, it makes the owners co-sovereign, as it were. Hence, it is arguably more important than the right to vote. The weakening of property rights by such devices as wealth redistribution for purposes of social welfare and interference with contractual rights for the sake of civil rights undermines liberty in the most advanced democracies, even as the peacetime accumulation of wealth and the observance of democratic procedures conveys the impression that all is well. And I'm just going to highlight this from one other individual, and that's Abraham Lincoln. Some of you may have heard of him. He was the president of the United States during the American Civil War. Now I'm in South Carolina, one of the rebellious southern states of that Civil War, which they call, they, they used to call the recent unpleasantness. The recent unpleasantness. <laughs> anyway. Uh, actually, the Civil War began when some Southerners fired cannon on a, a, a Northern or Union-held fort on an island at the mouth of uh, where Charleston is in South Carolina, Fort Sumter. Turns out that found out that uh, who fired these cannons at the fort that started the Civil War? <laughs> Cadets from the Citadel were outstanding. <laughs> Go figure. History has interesting aspects of it. But anyway, uh, Abraham Lincoln, which of course uh, put down the Southern Rebellion and as part of that free uh, ended slavery in the United States. He pointed out in this wider context, the prudent penniless beginner in the world labors for wages a while, saves a surplus with which to buy tools or land for himself, then labors on his own account another while and at length hires a new beginner to help him. This, says its advocate, is free labor, the just and generous and prosperous system which opens the way for all, gives hope to all and energy and progress and improvement of condition to all. Property is the fruit of labor, Property is desirable, is a positive good in the world. That such should be that some should be rich shows that some others can become rich, and hence is just encouragement to industry and enterprise. Let him who is homeless, uh, let let not him, let not him who is homeless pull down the house of another, but let him labor diligently and build one for himself, thus by example assuring that his own shall be safe from violence when built. If at any time all labor should cease and all existing provisions be equally divided among the people, at the end of a single year there would scarcely be one human being left alive. All would have perished, 
by want of subsistence. This idea, let's spread the wealth, let's divide the wealth, let's redistribute, redistribute the wealth. It is a false hope of raising people's prosperity and opportunities. It is private property and the open market that enables this to a greater extent. I'm going to skip a few things. I'm going to skip a few things. But it will be on the PowerPoint. And what I want to talk about is the general principles of the morality of the market here. The general principles of the morality of the market. The essential social principle of a free market society is that all human relationships are based on mutual agreement and voluntary consent. In the free marketplace, no one may be forced to enter into an exchange against his will. The individual is free to make his own production and consumption choices and we decide with whom to enter into trading associations. Let me ask you, have you ever gone into a shoe store, tried on a pair of shoes? Ah, no, 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 I don't know if it doesn't seem to fit too well. It's not quite what I was looking for. Ouch, I don't like that price. And so you, you start walking out, deciding not to buy anything, and some guy stops you at the door and says, you can't leave. The boss says, you can't, you have to buy a pair of shoes before you can get out. No, nobody's ever done that, right? Because I hope nobody's done that. Either. But why? Because you can't be forced to buy something that someone is selling. If you don't like it, if it's not what you're looking for, and if you, don't, and if you think it's not worth the price, you don't have to buy it, right? You walk out of the shoe store. You either don't buy shoes at all that time, or you walk and find another shoe store to see if they have something more like what you're looking for, and at a price that you, you're willing to pay and maybe can afford a little better, right? We all know that experience. That's the free market. Nobody can say, you ain't leaving until you buy a pair of shoes. <laughs> that part says so. It doesn't work that way. That's, that is important. It may sound trivial, but that's freedom, right? You can't be coerced, compelled to do something that is not of your own free choice and will. This establishes a moral foundation to the free market society. It prohibits the use of force in all human interactions. Any force that may be used and which is considered legitimate is only defensive force to protect an individual from the aggressive violence of other, any other person in society. The free market is based on the idea of the sovereignty of the individual to his own life. You own yourself. The king doesn't own you, right? Kings used to think they own you, right? And then let's face it, in, in the British Empire in America, there was once slavery, right? Unfortunately. And some guy comes along and says, I may not be a king, but I'm claiming that I owe you anyway. And you're going to do what I want, and if you don't do it, I'm going to threaten to do bad things to your body to make you do it. But in a free society based upon these market principles, you own yourself. You are sovereign. This is your property. This is about your most fundamental property, your mind and your body. Why do we usually consider one of the most egregious and, and despicable acts of human violence is rape? If I can put it, that, is that not actually a literal invasion of another person without their consent? Of course, this is terrible. And why are we shocked and disturbed by this? Because you own your body. You may not visit it without my permission. Okay, that's it. But that is a profound, if that principle is laying an entire different premise upon which human relationships are being today, you own yourself. This is your property. This is your little nation. You may not enter without my, without my issuing you a visa. He owns himself, and he is, he is not and should not be controlled and used as if he were the property of someone else, whether someone else is another private person or the political authority. If this principle of self-ownership of a property right in one's own person is not accepted, then it must be presumed that the individual and his actions can be controlled by someone else. Then the individual is a slave to the commands of that other person. That other controlling person can be one person, a group of people, or even a large majority claiming, uh, 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 supposedly being spoken for by the government. That doesn't make you any less a slave because it's in the name of the people instead of the king who claims divine right. The most fundamental moral issue is, I would suggest, for each of us, we're, you know, regardless of where we live, do you believe that others have a right to control your life? No. Do you not obey, the, if you do not obey the commands of others, do you believe they have a right to imprison you or even kill you if you do not obey them? No. Okay? Then you believe in liberty in the most fundamental sense. And liberty is the most precious thing that man has, has, has acquired, especially institutionally, 
over the last two and a half to 300 years. It didn't happen for everybody at the same time. Tragically, people talked about liberty but didn't always practice it, right? It was slavery. But men had courage. Slavery was ended. How was it ended? Because in the second half of the 1700s, the 18th century, a group of Englishmen, guided by their deep moral sense, their Christian sense, said that slavery is an abomination in the eyes of God. How dare one man claim to pay, play God? There's only one Lord in heaven. We are all his children and his servants. No one has the right to play God. And so they ended slavery in Great Britain in the 1790s, and then by an act of parliament, I'm sure you've heard some of this in your own history, in around 1834, 1836, an act of parliament abolished slavery throughout the British Empire, which would have affected you here. And then through a rather tragic and, 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 and violent civil war in the United States in the 1860s, over 650,000 people died in the American Civil War. Slavery was brought to an end as one of the outcomes of that. I beg to differ on that. Beg to differ about what? Yeah. yeah. Slavery never ended in the U.S. or for that matter in the um, British Empire. It just became more sophisticated. How are you with Well, why don't we wait for the question and answer, okay? <laughs> Which is fair enough. But the fact is, is that that is one of the most precious results of both freedom and free enterprise. You are sovereign as a consumer, as an individual, as the determiner of your own life. You are not a slave, you are a free human being possessing yourself. And that is what has made the setting that has enabled free men to have pursued their free minds and abilities that slowly but surely, like in those first graphs I showed, has slowly but surely over the last 200 years begun to raise humanity out of poverty and towards prosperity. Thank you very much. We are a little bit behind schedule. We're supposed to take a break now until 10.30. Okay. We'll have some drinks and some, some cookies, but if, I don't know if it's up to you if you want to. Well, we can take one or two questions quickly and then just have a slightly shorter break. Is that okay? Maybe 10 minutes instead of 15? Yeah. Okay. You implicitly were raising your hand first. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, all of the things that you have said uh, quite ideal, but it depends on a human to bring it out into a reality. And it also depends on the moral condition of that human. I don't deny that. But the, 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 whether I'm polite and courteous, whether I uh, treat you the way you want me to treat you, is obviously a matter of my decision of my conduct towards you. However, uh, what reinforces me to think twice before I am rude, discourteous, impolite, or, or cheating towards you is what will be the consequences? If I am the, the, you know, the image like the medieval era, you know, there's the king, the lord of the manor, right? The knight in the castle. And he has all these, the, these serfs on the land. They can't leave the land. They have to work for him. They have to grovel before him. And he can do anything he wants. He can say anything. He can be as rude and as nasty and as abusive as he wants. And they have no choice. Right? There's no cost to his behavior, or there's minimal cost, in the sense of people's negative reactions having negative effects on him. But in the marketplace, you cannot show those qualities and characteristics without bearing consequences. Now, you might do, choose to bear the consequences, but there are consequences. You're discourteous to your customers? I'm not going to ever go back in that store. That guy's rude and impolite and unhelpful. You do that to your employees. Rude, discourteous, nasty. And guess what? Some of them will start saying, why do I take this? And to the extent that they want to and are willing and can, they're going to start looking around for another job. The market at least gives avenues of opportunity to get away from other people's bad behavior. It's not like a perfect world. There is no such thing as a perfect world. But in an imperfect world with imperfect people, in which people do imperfect things, what is the institutional arrangement that is possible for people that's going to minimize that kind of behavior and create incentives not to do it? And I would argue that that's what the market does. 
Not perfect people, we're talking about imperfect people, but which is more likely to foster and cultivate that? And I would say the freedom of individual liberty in the marketplace does that. Okay, uh, no other hands right now? All right, let's do that break, and for those of you who can be here, we'll begin in about another 10 minutes. Thank you very much.